Good morning. morning. Welcome to Sunday Worship at Centenary United Methodist Church. Greetings to all who are following us on Facebook Live. Greetings to those who are listening to us on 97.9 The Bear. Special greeting this morning to my mother who's watching me from Walnut Cove, North Carolina. And a special greeting to my youngest son, Gabriel, who had better be watching me from Syracuse, New York. (laughs) My name is Van Spivey and I'm your pastor. It's good to be here this morning. We have a few announcements. A few brief announcements. Our middle school youth are going to Washington, D.C. this afternoon. They're going to be there till Wednesday. So be in prayer for them and their chaperones. Our history room is ready for you to come walk through it. The the theme this month is uh, sports in Centenary's history. It's a really nice display if you'll take time to go and walk through that. And then there is a reception after this service for the pastor and his family if you'd like to attend that. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Several members of my family are here today. May you be blessed by worshiping Jesus Christ here at Centenary United Methodist Church. Amen.
Our greeting this morning comes from Psalm 82. I invite you to stand. Our greeting this morning is from Psalm 82. It's a responsive greeting. God is seated in the divine council and in the midst of God's holds judgment. Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Our opening hymn is on page 577 of the Red Hymnal, uh, God of Grace and God of Glory.
Let us pray together our opening prayer found in your bulletin or on the screen behind me. Let us pray. Lord of justice and mercy, we come to you this day seeking your healing and reconciling love. Help us to be open to your word, your presence, your compassion. Clear our hearts of those things which block your will. Keep us focused on enabling power so that we, having been healed, may more fully serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
It's on. Paul okay. will turn it up for you in a second. Okay. There oh, we go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad about it. So, uh, any children that want to come down Yeah, that finger does. Now, our so our pointer finger, that is... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we pray for those who are pointing us in the right direction, like our teachers and our pastors and helpers at church. You're going to go to a new grade, so could you pray for your new teacher? Yeah, that sounds a great idea. That is... I'm glad that you pray for all your teachers. Wow. So our next finger is our tallest finger, and we... Yeah, and our middle finger is our tallest finger, and that's the one we use to help us remember to pray for our leaders. So we have leaders in the country, we have leaders in our state, and in our town, so we can pray for them. Now, our ring finger, did you know that's our weakest finger? I learned that. Did you know that's our weakest finger? It's our weakest finger. I didn't know that. Did you know that? Oh, wow. Well, I need to hang out with you more. So when we look at our ring finger, that can help us pray for those who are sick and weak. And then our very last finger, we made it to the end. Our last finger, it reminds us to pray for ourselves. That's great. And so, well, then (laughs) maybe... Yeah? Oh, okay. Well, then maybe you can pray for him, too. Maybe. Okay. You you tell me in a minute. Let's say our prayer, and then you can tell me all about it, okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for prayer. 
please help us remember our five-finger prayer to help us remember those who need our prayers. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. In the midst of the multitude of words in our daily lives, speak your eternal word to us that we may respond to your gracious promises with faithfulness, service, and love. Amen. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 17. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is rising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people, Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. The epistle lesson is from Colossians 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, a disciple of Christ, Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, 
so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. The gospel according to Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend." Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The universe is made of stories, not atoms. So said poet Muriel Rukeyser, and I think I know what she meant. Humans are storytelling creatures. The moments of our lives become memories, and when we recall the memories and retell them, they become stories. Your life and my life is one big story made up of all the little stories we've lived and told and changed and retold. You may think I'm overstating my case that life is stories, but consider this. If you ask me to tell you about myself, do you think I would start by saying, I'm 60 years old, I'm 5 foot 11, I weigh 190 pounds, I have gray hair and blue eyes, and so on. I wouldn't. For one thing, I haven't seen 190 pounds in several decades. But more importantly, those pieces of data don't distinguish me from all the other 60-something slightly larger than average men you've ever known. I would probably start my answer this way. I was born in Winston-Salem, and I grew up just west of Wilkesboro in sight of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And voila, I would be telling you a story about me. I love stories, and I'm sure you do too. I love to read them. I love to watch them on my television. I love to listen to them being told. And I like to write stories also. I've written some Christmas stories that I hope to share with you someday. I often include stories in my sermons because people connect with stories more readily than they do with facts or explanations. For example, the following preacher story. 
Now, you know what a preacher story is because you've heard them a lot. They're the kinds of fictional stories that preachers tell about other preachers to make up and listen a little bit harder so they'll pay close attention to the real story that will follow. And I want to apologize in advance if you've already heard this preacher story. You probably have. Anyway, a church once received a new pastor. As the incoming pastor moved his own things into the office, he found on the desk a letter from his predecessor. The letter said there were three numbered sealed envelopes in the file cabinet. In the letter, the previous pastor wrote, if you run into trouble while pastoring this church, open an envelope. Of course, the new preacher thought he would never have to use those letters. When he'd been at the church less than a month, he tried to impose his will on vacation Bible school. This made the VBS volunteers so mad that rumors began to spread about him. Then he remembered the envelopes and opened envelope number one. The message inside read, you haven't been here long, but you decided to change VBS. And now everybody is ill at you. Tell them I said this was how I preferred to do it. Let them get mad at me instead of you. The new pastor threw the old pastor under the bus and soothed the people's anger. About a year and a half later, the pastor decided he knew the people well enough to nominate some different folks for key leadership positions. Well, the people who were already in those key leadership positions had been there many years and they didn't like that. They mounted a campaign that resulted in a very heated SPRC meeting with ominous words about the unlikelihood of any future pastoral pay raises. And then the pastor remembered the envelopes in the file cabinet and opened number two. The message read, you've now done something to make your leaders mad. And they either want to freeze your salary or have you moved. Tell them you were just implementing a new United Methodist Church policy and that you thought they would agree with it. It'll probably get you off the hook. And the pastor did this, and it did ease his troubles. In his fourth year, the pastor decided that the Methodist women had too much power over the kitchen. <laughs> I love how everybody laughs at that one. <laughs> you know, don't you? You know. He told the administrative board that he wanted to create a task force to investigate all kitchen policies and procedures, which drove the women of the church into revolt. So he went back to the third and final envelope, and he read these words. You've been here long enough to finally get the women mad. My advice to you is do what I did. Get three envelopes. <laughs> Just a story. Tom Greener did not leave me a letter or any envelopes. <laughs> so when I wander into a minefield here at Centenary, and I will eventually, later rather than sooner, I hope, I'll be on my own. Many of you are curious about me this morning because I'm the new pastor here at Centenary. Some of you are hoping that I will tell you my story today because you want to know what kind of person is your new spiritual leader. Well, as I preach and teach and as I get a chance to meet you one-on-one, -on -one, we will get to know each other better, but I don't want to spend much time on Van Spivey's story here today because Sunday is our time to gather and worship together, and when we worship together, there is another story that is far more important than mine. Our Lord Jesus Christ understood very well that life is made of stories, and he often chose to reveal God's truth through the stories that he told. Some of those stories were called parables. A parable is a short story based on some situation or scenario that the hearers can easily imagine. A parable is often like a joke because it always has a twist ending, something unexpected amidst the familiar elements. It's also like a joke in that if it has to be explained, it loses its punch. But a parable is supposed to make you think, maybe supposed to make you mad, but it's always supposed to work on your heart and your spirit. One day Jesus was out and about with the disciples and a lawyer from the crowd challenged him. Now back then, the work of a lawyer was very different than the work of a lawyer today. Today's lawyers specialize in civil law, and that was part of an ancient lawyer's job, but a Jewish lawyer would also know the moral law the rules that govern acceptable and unacceptable behavior, and the ceremonial law concerning rules about sacrifices and cleanliness. 
The Bible has another word for lawyer, and it's scribe. If you've ever wondered who the scribes were in the New Testament that you often see with the Pharisees, they were also lawyers. You see, before printing presses, scribes copied and recopied and compiled all the religious texts. They did it all by hand. And as you might imagine, in doing this tedious, painstaking work, they became very familiar with the words that they copied and recopied. They memorized them. They knew them well, so well that they were often consulted for interpretation and commentary. Thus, they were lawyers. In Jesus' day, there were two main parties or denominations of Jews. Some of these lawyers were Sadducees, and Sadducees limited their expertise just to written scripture and nothing else. They stuck to the written word. Some of the lawyers were Pharisees, and they immersed themselves not only in written scripture, but also in the oral teachings about that scripture from the great rabbis. This may seem like an irrelevant detail, but it will help us better understand what's going on in today's story. Rabbi, the lawyer asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Jesus replied, you tell me what's written in the law. He put the question back on the lawyer, and the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let me stop there for just a minute. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is part of something called the Shema. And every faithful Jew is expected to recite the Shema in the morning. It's found in Deuteronomy 6, and Jesus called it the greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself comes from Leviticus chapter 19. And all it is is a version of the golden rule, which says that we are to treat others the way we would have them treat us. The golden rule was very important to Jews and to Jesus. Jesus said that love your neighbor as yourself was like love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You can't separate them. They're like two sides of a piece of paper. They go together. In other words, if you genuinely love God, then you love God's children too. You love other people. If you love other people in doing so, you are loving God. Now, none of this was new teaching to the Jews. It wasn't revolutionary to hear this from Jesus. Every faithful Jew knew the Shema, knew the golden rule, knew they were connected. The Jews believed that they would be blessed by God if they obeyed these two rules. The Sadducees believed that their obedience would lead them to prosperity and blessedness in this world. The Pharisees thought it would lead to the resurrection of their body after death and never-ending joy in the presence of God. We should not be surprised that the lawyer got the answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We shouldn't be surprised that he got that right. He would have known. But remember what we were told at the beginning of this passage. He wasn't really curious about the answer. He already knew. He was testing Jesus. He was trying to make Jesus look bad. And the following line confirms this. The lawyer wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus another question. And the question he asked was basically this. Hmm, love your neighbor as yourself. But who is my neighbor, Jesus? Now, none of us think today that love your neighbor means love the people who live in your neighborhood. We're not that literal-minded, are we? We're not foolish. We've been taught that it means we are to love anybody that we encounter, whether we know them or not. The lawyer wasn't foolish either. So what did he mean? What was he implying by asking this question? And this is where our lack of familiarity with the historical context of our scripture sometimes hurts us. It would be helpful to know that at the time of Jesus, there was a debate, an ongoing debate among the Pharisees about to whom the neighbor in love your neighbor actually refers. They were not in agreement over it. Some Pharisees believed neighbor is to be understood as we understand it today, as anybody that you encounter in life. But there were others among the Pharisees who believed that it only referred to other practicing faithful Jews. If a person was a non-Jew, a Gentile, or a non-practicing Jew, a sinner, then they were not to be considered your neighbor. Let that sink in for a minute. There were people in Jesus' day who believed love your neighbor only meant love other obedient Jews. 
And if that doesn't shock you, I'll spell it out. It meant that you didn't have to love Gentiles. You didn't have to love sinners. You could simply ignore their suffering and pass them by. Friends, to love another person is to care for them, though. To feed them when they're hungry, to give them water when they're thirsty, to provide them when medicine with their, when they're sick, to bind up their wounds, to put a roof over their head in the rain, to protect them from harm, to stand up for them when they're unjustly treated. That's what love is. But there were and there still are today people who believe that there are those who do not deserve love, that they are not ethnically pure enough to be loved, that they are not morally good enough to be cared for. Their lives don't matter because they're not really human. It's hard to believe that anybody could be that cold-hearted, but it, it's right there in black and white. Thus, when the lawyer asked Jesus, who is my neighbor, what he is implying is, Jesus, who do I not have to love? Who can I pass by and ignore? And Jesus responds, as he often does, by telling a story. Once upon a time, a man traveled on the road from, Jericho to Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho. That was a terrible road. It was known as a hangout for thieves and robbers. Anybody choosing to take that route was taking his life into his own hands. Now, Je Jesus doesn't say that the man on the road was a Jew. And that's important because if he didn't say what kind of person he was, he could be anybody. He could be you. He could be me. He could be that lawyer. He could be Jewish, he could be a Gentile. Sure enough, the man on the road to Jericho is attacked by a gang of outlaws. They beat him to a pulp, they strip him naked, and they take everything he owns. The poor man is lying there by the road bleeding when a Jewish priest walks by. Here's some more context that helps. The people of Israel were divided into 12 tribes. Many of you know that. And each of the tribes got their own parcel of land. Bethlehem was in the land of Judah. Remember that from the Old Testament, from the prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. All of the tribes except one got land. The one tribe that didn't get land was the tribe of Levi. And they were given a special responsibility, and that was to take care of the holy things of God's people. And so the Levites, when the temple was built, they maintained it, they cleaned it, they guarded it, and they sang psalms during holy festivals. A small group within the Levites, the priests, was chosen to perform sacrifices and say prayers. Now, in return for taking care of God's holy things, since they didn't have land, all of the other 11 tribes would donate a tenth of their income to take care of the Levites. And what is a tenth of your income called? A tithe. They tithe to take care of the Levites and the priests. So keep in mind that means that the priests and Levites were completely dependent upon the generosity of other people for their lives. If the other tribes didn't tithe, they went hungry. Anyway, a priest walks by this wounded man and ignores him. Jesus doesn't say the priest was in a hurry. Jesus doesn't say the priest had more important business. He doesn't say that the priest didn't want to get blood on his robe. The reason for passing by was irrelevant to Jesus. This man who depended upon the kindness of other people, this man who was supposed to be a holy man, showed zero love for a fellow human being. Following behind him was a Levite who walked right by and did the same thing. Now in the lawyer's scheme of things, since the priest and the Levite didn't know if the man lying there was an obedient Jew, he might not be my neighbor. They weren't obligated to help him. Next, a Samaritan shows up. More historical context. The Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. The Samaritans were ethnically diverse and they lived north of the Jews. And the Samaritans considered themselves to be the only true followers of the religion of Moses and Abraham. So they thought the Jews were narrow-minded and bigoted. The Jews, on the other hand, thought that the Samaritans were subhuman half-breed mongrels who were religious heretics and that they deserved nothing more than extermination. These two groups hated each other, and at times they had been at war with each other, so they had learned that the best thing they could do was to avoid all contact. Yet this Samaritan stopped on the road to Jericho, and he took pity on this poor wounded man who, for all he knew, was a Jew. 
He cleaned his wounds. He bandaged him. He put clothing on him. He put him up on his own mule and took him to an inn where he could get food and water and rest. He even gave the innkeeper his money and said, take care of him, and when my money runs out and you have to spend more, I'll come back and make sure you're repaid. Now, if the first part of Jesus' story where the Jewish holy men were made to look like villains didn't get the crowd's attention, casting a hated Samaritan as the hero would have made them absolutely furious. And to try and get a feel for what this probably felt like those at that day when he told the story. Imagine that the man on the road to Jericho who was robbed was a retired Iraq War veteran. And imagine that the first person who passed him was a Methodist preacher. And the second person who passed him was a choir member. That should upset you a little bit. And then imagine that the one who stopped was a jihadi with an AK-47. That's outrageous, isn't it? Doesn't that make you mad? Think of how it must have made them feel that day to hear that story. And if you can't imagine that, then imagine somebody else instead of a, a jihadi. I don't know what pushes your buttons. I don't know what triggers you. Maybe it's the idea of a KKK member in a hood stopping to help somebody that makes you mad. Or maybe it's an undocumented immigrant. Or maybe it's a Black Lives Matters protester with a sign. Or maybe it's a militia member with an AR-15. Or maybe it's a conservative Republican. Or maybe it's a liberal Democrat. I don't know what pushes your buttons, but just imagine that person being the one who stops to offer love. We don't want to imagine everybody as being capable of giving and receiving love, do we? This may have been the most shocking, offensive story that Jesus ever told. And I'm surprised that they didn't stone him on the spot. But apparently they were all stunned into silence. They didn't know what to say. And then Jesus, the greatest storyteller who ever lived. Jesus, the one who laid down his life so that we might all be saved. Looked calmly at this lawyer, knowing that the man had been testing him, and asked, which of the three men was a neighbor to the one who was robbed? Do you see what Jesus did there? He turned the lawyer's question upside down and inside out. The lawyer wanted to know who he could exclude from his concern. Who can I ignore Jesus? Who can I hate Jesus? Who can I treat as not fully human Jesus? But Jesus said to him, in effect, friend, you're asking the wrong question. You ought to be asking, am I a person who loves other people the way God loves me? That priest and that Levite owed everything to the love of other people, and yet they had no compassion in their own hearts. And so even though they were considered holy, even though they considered themselves holy, they would not experience the fullness of God's blessing because they were not willing to share the fullness of God's love. But that Samaritan couldn't just pass on by and leave that man lying there. His heart wouldn't let him. No amount of indoctrination about who does or does not deserve love would override his instinct to reach out. 1 John 4 says, Let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Let me read that again. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a perfect example of that truth. Jesus didn't care that the priest and the Levite had the outward appearance of religious faith. Their lack of love showed that they didn't even know the God that they said they served. And yet a hated Samaritan's care for a wounded man showed that despite what most Jews thought, even a Samaritan could know God because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. I love stories. And for me, this may be the very best story in the Bible. Because it shows how revolutionary Jesus really was. He was a threat both to the Jewish religious hierarchy and the Roman political order. This unconditional love that Jesus taught and lived overturns every hierarchy. And upends every system of worldly order. Why do you think he was crucified? 
If we don't get this about Jesus, then we don't get Jesus. But most importantly, this parable is the gospel in a nutshell. Whether I'm the one lying in the ditch or the one who reaches down to lift that person up, who we are and whether the world considers us holy or not does not matter to God. What matters to God is that we love other people the way God loves us, with no strings attached, without counting the cost. That's who we are, brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's what we are called and empowered to do. Every decision we make in church meetings, every dollar we ask people to put in an offering plate ought to be saturated in Christ-like compassion. Who is the good neighbor to those who need help, Centenary United Methodist? The ones who show them mercy. As you have for 250 years now, go and do likewise. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn is number 356. You may not know it, but it's a beautiful melody. You can sing it in English or Spanish, too. The hymn is called Pues Si Vivimos, which means when we are living, sing it either way, 356, and you're invited to stand if you're able. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church whose holy and apostolic faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Catholic Church, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
crucified, dead, and buried. Third day he arose again, descended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. There is a link in our worship program as well as online if you would like to give to the ministries of Centenary Church. Now, let us offer ourselves to God and our gifts for the ministry of Jesus Christ.
Please be seated. As we move into a time of sharing amongst the congregation, I'll ask, are there any joys, celebrations, or concerns to share today? Larry. <laughs> Are there others? Paul. Uh, my friend Joe and Cyber will have my name with us uh, today. We don't get to see her very much, but uh, some people say I did not realize you had a younger child. <laughs> Good to have you this morning. Charles. Lift up Clyde Martha Shell. Thank you. Is he in the hospital? So we lift up Norlin, who who had a fall this week. Norlin, a uh, longtime member of our choir, they go up to Michigan during the summer. Uh, so we lift them up as as he heals and recovers. Thanks for sharing that. Let's go to the Lord for a time of prayer. Loving God, how are we going to ever be worthy disciples for you? We're so overwhelmed by all of the needs in our life and in the world. The cries of people who feel threatened by others, those who are in need, those who are in danger, those who are alienated. It rings in our ears and in our hearts. Sometimes we'd like to just run and hide, hoping that all this turmoil is going to go away. But it doesn't. It sits outside our doors, and it waits for us to do something. Lord, Help that something be service and compassion. Help us to remember how you've forgiven and blessed each one of us, how you've called us blessed and beloved. We're reminded in today's scripture of the compassion of a Samaritan. We like that story because it warms our hearts, but now it is time to take that story too hard. We're called to reach beyond our comfort zone to those in need, to the alien, to the injured, to the lost, to the least, to the lonely. It's difficult for us to do, and we need to feel your powerful presence with us. Bless us again, O oh Lord, with a good measure of courage and strength that we may truly serve you. Bless those whose names and situations we brought before you today for healing, for hope. In your mercy and love, help us to reach out to others as you've reached out to us. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I invite you to stand for our closing hymn. It's on page 396. Oh, Jesus, I have promised.
You may be seated. For a Methodist minister, when you get to this time of year, it's chaotic. You find out you've got to move, you've got to do everything in the world, and it's very difficult. I mean, you've got to sell a house, you've got to buy a house, you've got to move. Anyway, it's very tough. We want to welcome Van, and this is a part of it at this particular point. But I also want to thank Anne Marie. Anne Marie, wait, stand up so I, they'll know where you are. She do not want to stand up, she's got to. That's his wife, and that's her family. So let's make sure we make her welcome. She's had a busy day. I'm just telling you, she's had a busy day. If you can get in your bulletin and get the celebration of an appointment out, we'll go through that. Good to have you. <laughs> Dear friends, today we welcome Reverend Van Spivey, who has been appointed to serve as our pastor. We believe that he is well qualified and has been prayerfully appointed by our Bishop Leonard Fairley. Van, you have been sent to live among us as a bearer of the word of God, a minister of the sacraments, and a sustainer of the love, order, and discipleship of the people of God. Today I reaffirm this commitment in the presence of this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as a, as, as a people committed to participate in the ministries of the church by your presence, your prayers, your gifts, your service, and your witness, Will you, you who celebrate this new beginning support and uphold Pastor Van in these ministries? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger. Let us pray. Almighty God, you still call us to go into your service and spread the message of the salvation of your son. Bless richly, we pray, your servant Van's entrance into our fellowship. Fill him with the power of your Holy Spirit and let him find with us an open door for the word. We also pray for your church on earth. Equip us with a spirit of willingness that we, we with courage can witness about you by the profession of our mouths and through our way of living. Grant us all to partake in your strength and joy so that we can enter into the anxieties and suffering of the world to be radiating and make alive that hope which Christ gives. All this we dare to pray of you, for you are to us the Father of mercy and the God of grace. You are the Son, the Savior, and the Redeemer, you are the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Helper, and the Giver of life. Blessed be to you. Amen. Amen. Yeah, give him a hand.